All right. Well, we are at two o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, I am recording this for those that are not able to make it today. We know how busy everybody is, um, but just wanted to uh, welcome everyone. This is our March uh, maternal webinar where we're going to be hearing from our presenter on valvular heart disease. Um, this is our sixth lecture in our cardiac education series. We do plan to have a Q&A session um, at the end of the webinar, uh, but we, if we run out of time, just um, you can send your questions and we'll get some answers um, from our presenter today. You can add your questions into the chat at any time um, throughout the, the presentation today. Um, the, the recording and the slides will be available on our website, www.georgiapqc.org, as well as uh, we will upload those to MS Teams for those with access. Um, and then if everyone could just mute their lines, that would be fantastic. Uh, as always, we just have a, a few updates. Our next maternal webinar is scheduled on May 2nd. We do not have a, a webinar in April given that's our annual conference month um, that's going to be taking place the 13th and the 14th. Um, so our May webinar will cover the topic of pulmonary hypertension and pregnancy and our speaker will be Dr. Joel Harden. Um, as many of you know, quarter three and quarter four hypertension data submission, we have extended the deadline to March 31st, given some of our um, data transformation um, opportunities there. Um, and so those are now you can get those in through survey one, two, three, or you can get those in uh, by the end of the uh, month. Quarter one, 2023 hypertension and our first cardiac data submission is going to be due April 30th. More to come on that. Uh, we will be sending reminders uh, before uh, quarter uh, data is due. And then AIM had a technical assistance presentation webinar, they call them TAP webinars, and they focused on the importance of trauma-informed care. And I believe that was last week and I attended, it was a really great um, webinar and there was some great resources shared. So I encourage you all to check out AIM's Vimeo uh, channel where you, there's a bunch of videos up there, but this one is also there and check that one out. We're also gonna be updating our website with some of the resources that were shared um, on that one. And then um, as most of you know, and may have already received the email about registering for our GAPQC annual meeting, which is April 13th and 14th. Um, April 13th is in person and the 14th is virtual. Um, and so if you have not received that, please let me know. We can get that out to you, um, but we encourage everybody to participate in that. And um, here is just a snapshot of the uh, Medicaid unwinding toolkit that um, some of you have probably already seen, but I just wanted to call this attention to everybody. Um, when the federal government ends the public health emergency, the PHE, um, which was uh, you know, put in place in response to COVID, Georgia and all other states will be required to redetermine eligibility for approximately 2.6 million Medicaid and Peach Care for Kids members. Um, so every Georgia Medicaid member has a right to continue receiving uninterrupted health benefits um, if they are eligible, but there are some you know, timeline requests for required information. Um, so in order to avoid any gaps in coverage, which can, which can really impact maternal health, um, we just uh, sh we want you to be aware of this toolkit. It can be accessed at either of those um, websites underneath the peach. Uh, AIM has updated their website and you some of you I know go on there and see that this frequently, but there are simulation and drills for patient safety and they've really like created some some fantastic resources. So I encourage you to go there and um, do some of these simulations with your teams and, and download some of the education that's available. And I believe we reviewed this at the la on the last webinar, but um, our work group is working very hard over the last year and a half now to uh, begin creating this Georgia Cardiologist Referral Network for pregnant and postpartum people. And um, you'll see the uh, perinatal regions in the different colors. Um, you'll see the regional perinatals, perinatal centers. We have six. Um, they have the big star. And then you'll see the heartbeat, um, which is cardiologist locations. And there's not that many on there right now, we're aware of. This is our first phase of doing this. And, um, but some folks have submitted their survey responses and they want their practice to be listed. And so those are them, which you can see with the hearts. 
the birthing hospitals are in the blue circle. And then we want to celebrate our gap QC cardiac hospitals that have the orange ring around them. Um, so we have right now, I believe we're, we grew up to 11 systems now um, um, as of today that will be participating in the cardiac initiative. So we want this map to have more hearts and more orange rings. That's going to be our goal. Um, and we'll keep checking in on how this map is looking. Um, just calling attention to the website. Um, if there's a facility on here that has not signed up to be an active team member, um, meaning submitting data and really being part of that wave one active team cohort, you can download the enrollment form here um, and then submit that to me directly. If you have not completed, you do not need to enroll in this initiative, but if you want to participate in supporting that referral map, you can complete this um, hospital assessment of cardiac referral networks here in the middle. And then last but not least, if you have cardiologists or if there's cardiologists on here and you have colleagues in cardiology, we really encourage them to come here directly and add their um, cardiologist practice to this referral list. Um, we really want to see more hearts on that map. I won't go through this. This is something that we want to share at the top of every webinar. This is our key driver diagram for maternal cardiac conditions. We have our goal here to reduce SMM and mortality related to maternal cardiac conditions in Georgia. We have a SMART aim by February 6, 2026 to reduce harm related to existing and pregnancy related cardiac conditions through the fourth trimester. We have our five key drivers, our five R's here in the middle and our interventions here. Um, those that have a heart next to them are highlight. Those are our key structure measures. And then here are our process measures. Um, and um, I was mentioning uh, the, or, or when folks joined earlier, there's a big component of education, which is why we are doing these foundational uh, cardiac lectures. But here are our process measures focusing on those with existing cardiac conditions, having a standardized pregnancy risk assessment. Um, out of those patients with cardiac conditions, those that had a multidisciplinary care plan before their admission. And then we have education for P3 through P5, which is um, OB provider nursing education on cardiac conditions and respectful and equitable care. And we've also included ED provider and nursing education on cardiac conditions. We have one optional process measure, which is the cardiovascular disease assessment among pregnant and postpartum women. So something to go back to your, um, with your teams if you're listening to this on the recording, if you want to get yourselves familiar with some of the key metrics um, folks that are actively engaged are reporting on. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our cardiac group member, Dr. Duty, to do our introduction to our wonderful speaker today. All right. Thank you Great. so much, Lisa. Um, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marissa Plattner, who is currently a maternal fetal medicine specialist at Emory University and sees patients both at Emory Midtown as well as Grady Memorial Hospital. She went to medical school in Tel Aviv University in Israel and subsequently completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Emory. She then went up north to complete a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at Yale um, University School of Medicine. And then we were lucky enough to have her join the MFM faculty here at Emory in 2018. Um, her primary research interest and academic interests are in severe maternal morbidity as well as population health. So thank you so much, Dr. Plattner, for agreeing to be with us today. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Um, so I'm going to be talking about valvular heart disease. Um, we, we do see a lot of these cases at Emory, um, and we work very closely with our congenital um, cardiologist colleagues. Um, I have no financial disclosures. The objectives of this talk are really to um, help provide general recommendations regarding initial um, assessment and preconception care, um, being a better understanding of common valvular, valvular abnormalities. And I think um, I'm going to really touch on three major valvular abnormalities that are the most um, critical. Um, and understanding the options for management strategies for each of those during pregnancy and then we'll review a couple of cases at the end and go through some questions and hopefully have a little bit of time for other questions and answers um okay so due to significant progress in medical and surgical management of patients with complex congenital heart disease 
Um, we are seeing a significant increase in the last several years in the number of patients who are reaching adulthood and childbearing age. Um, and so now we know that congenital heart disease actually accounts for 30 to 50% of cardiac disease in pregnancy. When we look at cardiac disease in pregnancy, we're really looking at all sorts of cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, arrhythmias, anything like that. Um, when we look worldwide, the most common cause overall is rheumatic heart disease, um, accounting for over 90% of all heart disorders in pregnancy. Um, in women of childbearing age, especially looking at the non-industrialized regions. However, this is still something that we can see here in the United States or in developed nations um, because of extensive immigration patterns that have occurred in the last several years. And so we do see patients who have rheumatic heart disease um, in the US as well. When we look at the European Registry on Pregnancy and Heart Disease, this actually included patients from North America, Europe, um, Russia, Egypt, as well as um, a few other nations. Mitral stenosis or regurgitation was the most common valvular pathology, followed by aortic valvular disease at 23%. Um, and when they looked at this registry of patients, they found that women who had this, these isolated valvular lesions actually had a higher maternal mortality rate when compared to those with other congenital heart defects. Um, so just something to keep in mind that these isolated valvular lesions are um, still very critical for us. So if you're seeing these patients in your practice, ideally we're, we're getting them in preconception. Um, and women who have known valvular heart disease who desire conception should really have a preconception consultation with a cardiologist who specializes in management. Um, so that they're able to make informed pregnancy decisions. Um, this would include a very detailed history, including any prior surgeries or valve interventions, um, physical exam to evaluate for any murmurs, volume status, regular venous distension, EKG, echo, and then also determination of what is the underlying cause. Was this something that was inherited in a congenital fashion, rheumatic heart disease, family history, secondary to endocarditis. Um, many women are unaware of the risks of heart disease in pregnancy and the patient education is really one of the most critical aspects of the preconception assessment. Um, and figuring out what that underlying cause is as well. And if there's any other associated lesions to be aware of. So the first thing, well, one of the first things is wanting to make sure that you have a transthoracic echocardiogram. Um, this is certainly indicated in patients with either known or suspected valve disease. Ideally, this is done prior to conception. Um, and this is really critical in determining the exact type and severity of the valvular disease or the valvular lesion, as well as looking at the degree of left or right ventricular dilation and function, specifically the ejection fraction, wanting to evaluate for the presence of pulmonary hypertension or any other associated cardiac defects that may be present. In the setting of stenotic valve lesions, um, we know that valve gradients may increase during pregnancy. And so if the echo is already being done during pregnancy, this should really be interpreted accordingly. Um, in general, for regurgitation, the severity of regurgitation remains either, it could be unchanged during pregnancy actually, or could increase or decrease. Um, as a result of that, the physiologic changes in pregnancy, um, left ventricular systolic function is usually unchanged in pregnancy. But we really like to have this as a baseline prior to seeing those changes occur. So we know if there are changes or not. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In some patients, cardiac MRI may be used as a risk stratification tool. Um, usually this is most useful in women who have other associated aortopathies, women who have Marfan syndrome or bicuspid valve associated aortopathy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other things that we want to make sure are done pre-conception are exercise testing. Um, this can be done with or without 
echocardiograms or cardiopulmonary testing. This is actually one of the really key things that can aid in doing a full risk assessment to objectively estimate the functional capacity for a patient. Um, I often tell my patients that pregnancy is really a stress test on your body. And so for our cardiac patients, it, it truly is. And so if they've had prior exercise testing in the um, time prior to conception, we can get a much more accurate assessment of how they will tolerate a pregnancy. Um, and it does tend to be a really important determinant of the pregnancy outcome. Um, when we see an abnormal or blunted chronotropic response to exercise, this actually has an increased risk of adverse outcomes in pregnancy for women with known existing congenital heart disease. Um, it's also really useful in women who have severe or asymptomatic um, aortic stenosis to be able to quantify what is their true functional capacity and assess their blood pressure response to the physiologic changes of exercise and pregnancy. Um, in women who have mitral stenosis or symptoms that are out of proportion to the degree of valve stenosis, a stress echo can also be helpful to examine the changes in the right ventricle um, systolic pressure with exercise. The other thing that we sometimes like to look at is biomarkers, um, specifically like beta um, natriuretic peptide. Although the utility of these is really unclear in terms of risk stratification in women considering pregnancy, um, because we know that this can go up during pregnancy, even in uncomplicated pregnancies, but may be useful to have a baseline prior to pregnancy. Um, and if it's normal, then you can use that as an exclusion for cardiac decompensation during pregnancy. And then the other thing is we always wanna review patients' medications um, to make sure that they are on medications that are safe and not known to be teratogenic during pregnancy. Um, so there are some medications, specifically the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers that will need to be discontinued or substituted with an alternative drug because we know they are teratogenic for a developing fetus. Um, some women with valvular heart disease may also require interventions prior to pregnancy um, and to minimize those risks or be advised to avoid pregnancy so that we can get that intervention done. Um, specifically high-risk lesions that we worry about are severe symptomatic mitral stenosis and severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. Um, and feel free to interrupt if you have questions or put questions in the chat that I can answer. Um, so there's a couple of different methods of risk assessment of how we categorize women during pregnancy or patients during pregnancy. Um, in terms of their um, congenital heart defect. And this is really focusing on valvular heart disease specifically. So I'm gonna try to give examples of those, but we use something called the modified WHO criteria to give us an idea of what is a patient's risk for adverse outcomes during pregnancy. And I think something that's important to know is that actually most women who have mild forms of valvular heart disease will do very well throughout pregnancy. Um, so patients who have things like mitral valve prolapse, mild pulmonic stenosis, um, generally are considered to be class one, and they don't have an associated increased risk of maternal mortality, and they don't have really any, or if, if there is any, very, very minimal increased risk of maternal morbidity. Um, generally speaking, stenotic valve are less well tolerated during pregnancy, um, compared to virgin lesions, but either of these can lead to compensation, um, to decompensation, sorry. So looking at WHO class two, conditions are in this category are associated with a very small increased risk of maternal mortality or a moderate increased risk of maternal morbidity. And most of the time when we're talking about maternal morbidity, we're really talking about the risk of um, arrhythmias or heart failure. Um, the valve conditions in this risk group include a repaired tetralogy of Fallot, which may have some mild pulmonary regurgitation or stenosis. And so for these women, usually they do require some sort of follow-up once every trimester with their congenital cardiologist um, to take a look and do an echo and make sure that they are continuing to do well and tolerate the pregnancy well. Um, class WHO class two to three conditions are associated with a significant increased risk of maternal mortality, as well as a moderate to severe risk of maternal morbidity. Um, this 
refers to patients who either have a native or a tissue valvular heart disease that's either not considered WHO class one or class four, or women who have a bicuspid aortic valve and have an ascending aorta that's less than 45 millimeters in diameter, which is considered to be a normal size. Um, but those women are still at higher risk of complications because of their bicuspid valve and the associated aortopathy that can come with that. Um, WHO class three conditions are associated with a significantly increased risk of maternal morbidity and mortality. These patients really require um, expert counseling, ideally prior to pregnancy. This may include consideration of alternatives to pregnancy, termination of pregnancy. Um, they do need intensive specialist cardiac as well as obstetric and maternal fetal medicine monitoring throughout pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. Usually these patients do require some sort of monthly or bi-monthly cardiology and obstetric follow-up during pregnancy, really at a valves, women with moderate mitral stenosis, severe and asymptomatic aortic stenosis, or women who have a bicuspid valve that have a slightly dilated ascending aorta with a diameter of 45 to 50 millimeters. And then last is the WHO class four conditions. These are associated with extremely high risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity, where we consider pregnancy to be contraindicated. Um, if a woman presents with one of these lesions early on in pregnancy, then we do generally recommend a discussion regarding termination. If a pregnancy is terminated, these patients should undergo appropriate intervention for that high-risk valve and or aortic disease prior to attempting subsequent pregnancies. Um, if they choose to continue the pregnancy, they should be cared for as a class three with monthly or bimonthly cardiology, maternal fetal medicine follow-up at a minimum. And these patients include those with severe mitral stenosis, severe and symptomatic aortic stenosis, or a bicuspid aortic valve with an ascending aorta of greater than 50 millimeters, as well as women who have severe ventricular systolic dysfunction with an ejection fraction of less than 30% or pulmonary hypertension, um, which are not valvular disorders, but other disorders that fall into this class four category. So we'll move on to talk a little bit more about specific lesions. I mentioned that um, <clears throat> regurgitant lesions are generally a bit more well tolerated than the stenotic lesions. So we'll focus more on um, the stenotic lesions and left-sided lesions are also <clears throat> less well tolerated than right-sided lesions. And this is really because of the increased cardiac output and fixed lesions that we see with those two conditions. Okay, so starting with aortic stenosis, um, the most common cause of aortic stenosis among patients of childbearing age is what's known as congenital bicuspid aortic valve disease. Um, you can also have aortic stenosis secondary to rheumatic heart disease. It is pretty uncommon, and if you see this, it's generally also accompanied by mitral stenosis. This can be present in patients who have connective tissue disorders, Marfan's disorder, Ehlers-Danlos, Turner syndrome, or can be a result of infective endocarditis as well. Um, if patients are provided with a timely diagnosis um, and appropriate follow-up, there is a subcategory of patients with aortic stenosis that can tolerate pregnancy well if the obstruction is mild or even moderate. So if the valve area is greater than one centimeter squared. Um, the reality is that the overall maternal mortality is still quite low at less than 1%, even in patients who do have severe aortic stenosis. However, there is a high risk of other complications for both the mom and the baby, and this rises dramatically with the increasing severity of aortic stenosis. Um, we know that nearly a third of moms who have an aortic valve area of less than 1.5 do end up requiring some sort of hospitalization during their pregnancy, most of the time secondary to heart failure, and then either atrial and ventricular arrhythmias as the most common causes. Their inability to accommodate the increased cardiac output and stroke volume ends up increasing the left ventricular and diastolic pressure, and this can precipitate 
pulmonary edema or arrhythmias. Um, even maternal deaths in aortic dissection when moved by cuspid aortic valve are still quite rare, um, but they also have the increased instance of additional unfavorable outcomes for the fetus as well, including fetal growth restriction, respiratory distress for the baby, and preterm birth. So I, I saw this diagram in one of the studies that I was reading or um, reviews. And so I wanted to include it because I thought it was really helpful to have an idea of how to counsel these patients when they come early on or prior to conception, ideally. Um, so we know that with aortic stenosis, there's increased blood volume, or in pregnancy, there's increased blood volume and increased stroke volume. And this leads to the increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure and can lead to heart failure, chest pain, and syncope. So prior to conception, um, if the stenosis is mild to moderate, it's very reasonable to proceed with pregnancy at that time with regular interval follow-up. If um, you've done all your testing and you did your physical exam and your echo, BNP, stress test, all of those things, and you find that it's severe, then it gets broken down into either symptomatic or asymptomatic. And so if they're symptomatic with a normal ejection fraction of greater than 50%, um, then they should undergo valve intervention prior to pregnancy. If they are asymptomatic, um, but are found to have an ejection fraction of less than 50%, they should also undergo valve intervention. If they're asymptomatic with a normal ejection fraction, um, then they are okay to proceed with pregnancy with a very, very close follow-up. Ideally, these women get delivered at term, um, and the goal is for a vaginal delivery, except in a few rare cases. Um, epidural anesthesia is really critical, and so they should be meeting with an obstetric anesthesia provider prior to delivery timing. Um, many of these women may require an assisted second stage to decrease the um, increase in pressure that occurs during Valsalva at the time of the vaginal delivery. Or if they have decom decompensated heart failure at the time of delivery, then a C-section would be indicated. Um, any questions about this? I know it's, it's a busy slide, but I thought that the pathways were really nicely drawn out here to give us a nice idea. There's no optimal treatment for medical treatment for aortic stenosis during pregnancy, um, but you can do some preload reduction and cautious use of diuretics for patients who are symptomatic. And then for patients who are um, unresponsive to that, if they're early on in pregnancy, there should be a conversation regarding termination of pregnancy again, or catheter-based valvuloplasty or surgical replacement postpartum. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that after we go over bicuspid valves. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the bicuspid aortic valve is the most prevalent congenital cardiac abnormality. And I want to talk about it a little bit separately from the aortic stenosis because it does have is like more commonly associated aortopathies that go with it. Um, it does affect about 1% of the general population and has a two to three to one male predominance. It may be a functionally normal valve or it can be associated with stenosis and or aortic regurgit regurgitation. Um, it's the most, actually the most common cause of aortic stenosis and isolated aort or aortic regurgitation. And then dilation of the ACE and the aorta is oftentimes coexistent independent of the valvular function. So all patients who have a bicuspid aortic valve should actually undergo a preconception transthoracic echo with assessment for aortic valve dysfunction, and then also an assessment of the ascending aorta for dilation. This will likely include some sort of additional cross-sectional imaging, like a CT scanner or MRI, to look for signs of aortic coarctation, as well as assessing the patient for any features of associated Turner syndrome that can go with the bicuspid aortic valve. Um, Bicuspid valves can occur actually sporadically or with an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. They do have variable penetrance, and so it's really hard to say what the exact inheritance is because um, it can be an isolated lesion or associated with other congenital cardiovascular defects. 
when we look at large family studies looking at bicuspid aortic valve, there seems to be about a nine to 10% risk in first degree relatives of the individual with the bicuspid aortic valve, and that's because of the variable penetrance. So it could be up to 50%, um, but really hard to say if that's accurate. Um, because of this, all pregnant women who have a bicuspid valve are recommended to have a fetal echo during pregnancy. And the reason for that, even though we can't often see a bicuspid valve on fetal echoes, is to evaluate the fetus for other aortopathies that can uh, coexist with a bicuspid valve. For patients with an indication for valve surgery or aortic surgery, the ideal time to do this is preconception. Um, that's because there are significant risks to the fetus associated with ca cardiopulmonary bypass that occurs during the surgery. Um, we really try to avoid surgery during pregnancy if possible, um, but the maternal risks are really similar to those in non-pregnant patients. Um, it's really just about the risk to the fetus during pregnancy. And so we're trying to reduce the risk of maternal and fetal complications during pregnancy, following pregnancy, and the risk of requiring surgery during pregnancy. If for some reason you have to perform surgery during the pregnancy for refractory heart failure, aortic dissection or progressive enlargement of the aorta with impending rupture. This is ideally done during the second trimester in order to avoid the teratogenic risk of the first trimester and the risk of impacting a third trimester de delivery. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but for most patients with a bicuspid aortic valve, but without high risk clinical features, Surgery to rep repair or replace the ascending aorta is indicated at a threshold root diameter of over 5.5. High risk clinical features are considered aortic coarctation, aortic root aneurysm, phenotype family history of aortic dissection or sudden death, or predominant aortic regurgitation, or an aortic growth rate of greater than 0.3 centimeters per year on repeated measurements. Um, surgery to replace or repair the aortic root for asymptomatic patients with a bicuspid valve is indicated if the diameter of the aortic root or ascending aorta is greater than five and they have at least one of those high-risk clinical features for dissection or if the patient in general is at a low surgical risk and the surgery, they have access to an experienced team to operate. Um, for patients who have an aortic diameter of greater than five for contemplating pregnancy, pre-pregnancy surgical aorta replacement is recommended. Although the actual optimal ascending aorta diameter threshold for surgery prior to pregnancy has not been clearly established, many experts would say, well, the potential risks and benefits of surgical repair um, at greater than 4.5 are probably reasonable to accept. Um, so that is the preconception workup. Now, when these patients come pregnant um, early on in pregnancy, if they come in and they already have severe aortic stenosis or an ejection fraction that's less than 40%, there are many experts who would suggest consideration of termination of pregnancy followed by a reparative surgery before another attempt at pregnancy. Alternatively, women who have severe aortic stenosis with no symptoms or only mild symptoms can be managed conservatively during pregnancy with very close clinical observation um, we recommend trying to maintain a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90, avoidance of the angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors, um, and then conservative management with beta blockers, oxygen, bed rest if necessary. If intervention during pregnancy is necessary for refractory symptoms of heart failure, potential options include a balloon valvotomy or a transcutaneous aortic valve replacement. Um, so balloon valvotomies are traditionally the first line option during pregnancy if the patient has failed medical management. The indication during pregnancy is really based on the severity of stenosis, the degree of left ventricular function, the aortic root size and the severity of symptoms. Um, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association guidelines suggest intervention only if there's true hemodynamic deterioration despite medical therapy, um, demonstrated by a change in the BNP and echocardiographic pulmonary arterial pressures to help differentiate between their symptoms 
um, and the physiologic changes of pregnancy. So especially for those patients who have a bicuspid valve, this is really the first line option if they have a suitable valve morphology. Um, unfortunately, there's no large series that has been done on this, but there's multiple isolated reports that do show very favorable results in terms of reducing the transvalvular peak gradient by over 50%. Um, it really optimizes the risks of pregnancy and labor and delivery. There are still recurrent risks that um, were really mostly limited to mild to moderate regurgitation developing um, or recurrent stenosis. And there were really no significant fetal complications reported um, either during the procedure or post-procedure. So most of the patients that have been reported who've undergone a balloon aortic valvotomy have gone on to have successful term deliveries. Um, the other option for management is a transcutaneous aortic valve replacement. This is actually really challenging for women who have um, an aortic valve because of a bicuspid valve, because of the shape of the valve and the difficulty in fitting it and the sizes that are option offered. Um, so this looked at patients, they looked at patients who came in with New York Heart Association functional class three heart failure during pregnancy and severe aortic stenosis. Um, most of them had this done secondary to a bioprosthetic valve deteriorating at least five years prior to the procedure. Um, and the transvalvular mean pressure gradient was reduced significantly after the procedure. And these patients really had no maternal or fetal complications. Now, one of the um, challenges is that these patients do require anticoagulation after the procedure in most cases. And oftentimes that is therapeutic anticoagulation. So it's um, pretty high doses of low molecular weight hep heparin that are required for them. Um, so this is really emerging as a viable option, but like I mentioned, is limited by um, patients who have a bicuspid aortic valve because of technical challenges, suboptimal imaging. Um, some of these patients have a pretty high likelihood of needing a permanent pacemaker after and there's also very limited dur durability of a prosthetic valve um, and may even make the surgical placement of a valve more complicated later on. Oh, Dr. Von Cannon's telling me that my slides are not advancing. <laughs> we were saying we, we think your slides are not advancing. I'm on slide 25. You don't we, see that? We see, we see 22, at least on our end. Yeah, Dr. Potter, sorry to interrupt. I think that I'm having the same issue, but I've been checking in with our team and everything is they, they everything's on point there. So I'm wondering if you'd like me to just advance the slides for you to stop sharing and then I'll share and that way we can um, see if that might be an issue with something on Teams. How does that sound? Yeah, do you want me to stop sharing and then try again? Is that easier? Um, yeah, you could do that. That might that might be great. Yeah. And then if that's still an issue, I can share as well because I have your slides. OK, let me try to stop and restart it. Perfect. Thanks for stepping out, everybody who, who just did. Wasn't sure who it was, but thank you. <laughs> What do you see now? So I see your first slide. And sometimes if you if you're sharing the presentation versus sharing the script, the, the actual screen, that's sometimes where the advancing of the slides can be, be uh, cause some challenges. So if if you could select the screen you want to share, um, that might be helpful. And I can go ahead and pull up if you're on um, slide 24, I can have that. You can just kind of follow along on your own there and whatever works best. Okay, well, let's see. Let me 
What do you guys see now? I see the first slide, your name. Okay, so it's not working for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I'll, right. I'll, are, are, are you on slide 24? Does that work? I'm on, I'm on 25. Okay, uh, let me just, all right. I'm going to pull mine up separately so that I. And I'm on Dr. Alkheim's, um, uh, just the, 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 the um, algorithm here. Okay, so I. Lisa, it's Iris. I think um, she's a few more slides ahead of this. I know that the number here says 25, but I think it's physically yeah. like the 25th slide, not yeah. adding up with the, yeah, keep going. You're right. Yeah. I don't know how or why it's different. <laughs> and then the next one. It's, uh, you know, it's the joys of, of Microsoft Teams, I think. So not pro probably nothing you've done, done. it's just the, the way Teams is. So I am on Dr. O'Kayam's slide 32. Um, um, keep going, next one. I'm, sure. Aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation, there we go. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so. Just briefly, I'll touch on aortic regurgitation um, because we don't see a lot of it in pregnancy and it is generally well tolerated when we do see it in pregnancy. Um, the increased heart rate and decreased systemic vascular resistance actually leads to a decrease in regurgitate flow. Um, women who have severe aortic regurgitation with an indication for valve surgery, um, including symptoms or marked left ventricular enlargement or an ejection fraction of less than 50%, should undergo surgery before pregnancy. Um, if it's just isolated aortic regurgitation with symptomatic heart failure, oftentimes this is medically managed during pregnancy with um, vasodilators and diuretics, um, such as furosemide and hydronaldine to decrease the afterload, as well as nitrates. Um, again, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are contraindicated because of the adverse effects on fetal development. I know. Most people do know that, but in case there are others who don't, um, you can go to the next slide. Sorry, I lost you guys. Okay. Um, so when we talk about the other major congenital heart defect that we worry about or valvular defect. Um, the thing that we worry about after aortic stenosis is mitral stenosis. Um, this is most commonly caused by rheumatic heart disease. And like I mentioned earlier on, this is the most common valvular lesion worldwide. Um, even though mortality remains low in women from developed countries, there's a, still a very high risk of fetal morbidity including fetal growth restriction and preterm birth. And this does increase with the severity of mitral stenosis. So, you know, there are rates that are as low as 14% with mild mitral stenosis, and then it goes up increasingly to 28% and 33% in moderate and severe mitral stenosis. Um, and in general, moderate women who have moderate or severe mitral stenosis do not tolerate pregnancy well. And this is because there is an increased cardiac output as well as an increased heart rate. This leads to an increased left atrial pressure. There's a decreased diastolic filling time, um, and this can result in that increased pressure and backing up into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema, edema pulmonary hypertension, um, atrial fib fibrillation, et cetera. Um, next slide. The functional significance of the degree of mitral stenosis is likely more closely related to the actual mean gradient across the valve. Um, and that usually does increase during pregnancy, as well as the effects on the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Again, these patients really do benefit from exercise testing prior to pregnancy to determine the underlying maternal risk. Um, 
the risk of clinical decompensation depends on the severity of the mitral stenosis prior to pregnancy. So heart failure generally occurs in pregnant patients with moderate or severe stenosis with an um, area of less than 1.5 centimeters. And even in previously asymptomatic patients, by the time they get to the second and third trimester, because the maternal blood volume and cardiac output peak around 32 weeks, these women can really have quite significant cardiac decompensation around that time. The rates of prematurity as a result of that are close to 20 to 30 percent. And like I mentioned, fetal growth restriction up to 20 percent. Um, and even stillbirth is higher for these patients up to 3 percent. Next slide. So management of these patients during pregnancy, um, there are therapeutic options for patients with mitral stenosis, both medically as well as um, surgical alternatives and catheter-based interventions, if available, with the choice being dependent mostly on the patient's symptoms and the degree of stenosis. Um, medical therapy includes limitation of activities, use of diuretics, as well as beta blockers for symptom control if um, heart failures or arrhythmias are pre present. Patients who have severe mitral stenosis are classified as WHO class four risk um, and percutaneous um, balloon mitrovalvuloplasty is a good option for these patients if they've been refractory to medical management. Um, patients who do have atrial fibrillation or a thrombus present may also require therapeutic anticoagulation. And then, um, if there are patients who are medically refractory, have very severe symptoms, or a very high pulmonary artery pressure, these patients actually may benefit from open mitral valve replacement. However, again, this does put the fetus at significant risk, um, but maybe the only option if percutaneous alveoplasty is not an option for this patient, for these patients. So generally speaking, we recommend valve intervention, even if they're asymptomatic prior to pregnancy. Next slide. Um, just briefly, there's different recommendations for labor and delivery for every patient and di with different valvular disorders. Um, but in general, women with low risk valve lesions can deliver at their local hospital um, if their providers are comfortable with that. However, women who have any of the moderate or high risk valvular lesions should really deliver at a hospital that has a specialty in cardiac disease and pregnancy. Um, and a team prepared to intervene for these patients, um, including those patients who have prosthetic valves um, or other high-risk lesions. Um, there should be a plan in place that has been distributed to all those on the team prior to the patient presenting for delivery, an OB anesthesia consult. Many of these patients, especially those with the high-risk lesions, do require continuous telemetry both intrapartum and postpartum, and we know that there's significant autodiuresis that occurs. And for the vast majority of women, vaginal delivery is the recommended mode of delivery um, while considering minimizing the Valsalva maneuvers with an early epidural um, and assisted second stage of labor. There are exceptions to that with a severely dilated aortic root, critical aortic stenosis with a reduced ejection fraction, and symptoms or an active aortic dissection, those patients should certainly not have a vaginal delivery and should be um, recommended to have a cesarean delivery. Um, I can pause there for a second or I can start to go over cases if people have questions or want to um, move on to the cases. Sure, it looks like we are in good time. If anybody has any questions, we can pause here for a second. Um, you can put your question in the chat or unmute yourself. Or we can move on to my cases. Looks like we have no bites. <laughs> okay. Next slide. Okay. Um, so just before I go into these cases, these are all real cases that we've had. Um, I tried to change some of the smaller details to make sure that they're all HIPAA compliant, but please um, keep any cases to yourself and don't discuss them with others. Next slide. Okay, so this is a 26-year-old G2P1. She presented at 15 weeks with a history of a bicuspid aortic valve um, that she had diagnosed aortic stenosis. Um, 
She had undergone a valve replacement in 2008 with a bioprosthetic valve and then presented with critical aortic stenosis that was symptomatic during this pregnancy. She had previously been followed for 10 years after her valve replacement and was asymptomatic and then had some loss to follow up, insurance changes, and then during this pregnancy it became very symptomatic with progressive dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea as well as significant hypotension down to the 80s or 50s. She got admitted to an outside hospital and was found to have a reduced ejection fraction of 35% with severe mitral regurgitation and moderate to severe aortic stenosis. Next slide. Um, she had a, oh, hold on. So oh, I went to the wrong slide. Okay. She had a repeat um, echo at the outside hospital that showed an ejection fraction of 24% with critical aortic stenosis. She got IV Lasix and then was transferred to a higher level of care for possible valve and valve replacement um, intervention. Her obstetrical history was notable for one prior full-term C-section without any cardiac complications and gestational diabetes and hypothyroidism. Next slide. Given her severe aortic stenosis, she was considered to be WHO class four and therefore um, pregnancy was contraindicated because of the significantly elevated risk of maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, her specific risk for a cardiac event was greater than 27% in pregnancy, and she'd already experienced many of those complications during this pregnancy, and she was only 15 weeks, um, including volume overload, ICU admission, and progressive cardiac dysfunction. So we reviewed these risks with her at length, as well as the specific risk of maternal mortality. Um, this is a highly desired pregnancy, um, and so she declined termination um, and opted for a valve and valve, transcutaneous aortic valve replacement. Um, so we talked to her about how, you know, she had this fixed cardiac output that was very preload dependent and the volume sh shifts were not being well tolerated. Um, and so she was seen by cardiology and anesthesia and our CT surgery team. Um, and we also talked to her about the child having a high risk of inheritance because it was due to bicuspid valve. Next slide. She underwent an uncomplicated valve and valve um, transcutaneous valve replacement procedure. Um, it was uncomplicated. She was started on aspirin 162 milligrams per day and was recommended to have um, endocarditis prophylaxis for lifelong. Um, she got IV diuresis prior to discharge and then went home on postoperative day two. Um, next slide. Unfortunately, after the procedure, she was diagnosed with a valve thrombosis, and that required therapeutic anticoagulation for the remainder of her pregnancy, but she actually underwent a scheduled repeat C-section at term. She was monitored in the CCU for 24 hours postpartum, and she had no complications and went home on postoperative day three. Questions about that case? Okay, um, we have one more case to go over. Next slide. This is a 22-year-old G2P1 at 17 weeks with a history of endocarditis, um, secondary to a dental procedure that actually required placement of a bioprosthetic mitral valve in 2017. And she presented, um, with acute cardiac decompensation, volume overload, and heart failure. She had been followed by a cardiologist every three months since her procedure and developed symptoms last the month prior to presentation of acute onset orthopnea, shortness of breath, and chest discomfort. Next slide. She got admitted to her local hospital where an echo showed severe right ventricular enlargement, severe mitral stenosis, and pulmonary hypertension. Um, she had normal left ventricular contractility. And then she also was transferred to a higher level of care. Her history was notable for a prior uncomplicated vaginal delivery. Um, and she had no significant medical history. So the plan for her, if you go to the next slide, sorry. 
Um, she again had an extensive discussion um, with the patient and her family regarding her current cardiac disease. And based on her echo results, she had a diagnosis of severe mitral stenosis as well as right ventricular failure and severe pulmonary hypertension. We discussed with her the physiologic changes of pregnancy leading to this increased risk of cardiac complications, including heart failure, arrhythmias, um, stroke, and even maternal mortality. Given that she had this um, pulmonary artery hypertension, her risk of mortal mortality itself without any intervention was actually as high as 25%. Um, and she was given the option of termination versus continu continuation of pregnancy. Um, if she chose to terminate the pregnancy, she would be a candidate for a surgical valve replacement as opposed to a transcutaneous mitral valve replacement. Um, and again, she opted for a transcutaneous mitral valve um, replacement. Um, and she said she would only opt for termination if she could not have that procedure done. Um, next slide. So the procedure was uncomplicated. She also went underwent a valve and valve um, mitral valve replacement. She was initiated at that time on therapeutic Lovenox um, and aspirin 81 milligrams, as well as oral diuretic and a beta blocker. She went home on post-operative day two, and she um, is still pregnant. Questions about that case? We can go over a couple of um, quick multiple choice questions. So what is the most common cause of aortic stenosis? People can put it in the chat or raise their hand or just take themselves off mute. My cussed aortic valve. Great, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. What is the most common complication in women with severe aortic stenosis? D, both B and C. Great job. Next slide. Next slide. Pregnant patients with severe mitral stenosis do not tolerate pregnancy well due to B, increased cardiac output and heart rate. Great. Next slide, Dr. Von Cannon, you're really. <laughs> <laughs> we have an excellent fellow here. <laughs> Very impressed. <laughs> I did not prep her with these answers. <laughs> um, in which cardiac lesion is the cesarean delivery recommended? I feel like it should be Jeopardy. I'm going to say B. We get there yeah. before Dr. Buchanan. <laughs> she was getting it. <laughs> she was. Next slide. Um, so I I just wanted to show this before we end because um, I thought it was a nice little flow chart for women who are of childbearing age with a known diagnosis of valvular heart disease of how to do an initial workup and preconception evaluation for these patients, um, including a risk assessment, genetics referral, if there's something inheritable, um, consideration of a consultation with maternal fetal medicine, talking about contraception, preventing infective endocarditis, really education for the patient to have a better understanding of what their risks for pregnancy are. Um, and then if they're pregnant, making sure that they have the options for management with a heart valve team and structural team, um, avoiding teratogenic medical therapy, addressing their anticoagulation issues, and making sure that they do have um, a multidisciplinary team available for labor and delivery. Next slide. These are my take home points. Um, just a reminder that cardiac output really does increase significantly already in the first trimester and continues into the second and third trimester. I think if there's one thing you take away from this, I think it would, should be that preconception counseling and multidisciplinary care throughout pregnancy is really key to successful and safe pregnancy for moms and babies. Um, exercise or stress testing prior to pregnancy is highly predictive of how pregnancy will be tolerated. And in general, vaginal delivery is the preferred method of delivery. Um, next, okay. So that is all I have. Um, 
I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Potter. We had to, that was right on time too. That was absolutely perfect. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulty, so I appreciate everybody bearing with us with that. So I'll just turn it over real quick to see if anybody has any um, anything anything final. And I see Dr. Krishnan, you're on off mute. So if you wanted to jump in, please chime in. No, I just wanted to say thank you, Marissa, for giving us this lecture. It was re really informative and um, it was very very helpful. Um, and then Lisa, I, I don't know, I tuned in late, so you might have already uh, mentioned, but just a reminder that we don't have a conference next month because of spring break, and we will regroup in May when uh, Dr. Hardin is scheduled to give a lecture on pulmonary hypertension. You got it, yes. Uh, we did a little announcement before you joined on, so um, thank you for that reminder to everyone, and I uh, appreciate everybody joining today. A follow-up email um, will be coming out shortly, and, and again, the, this will uh, be available on our website, georgiapqc.org. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks again, Dr. Plattner. That was a great lecture, Marissa. Thank you for having me. Bye.